Hello, everyone. Good morning to all our participants and to the attendees of our discussion. Welcome to the third, the last day of our conference. My name is Taras Fedirk, and I am anthropologist affiliated with the um, University of St. Andrews in Scotland. Today, I'm moderating the discussion about um, the left response in Ukraine to the war. Um, the discussion will take place over one hour and a half, approximately. The first part, 45 minutes, will dedicate to a round table with questions uh, from me as a moderator to our participants, the panelists. And then in the second part of our event, we are going to um, collect some questions and answer them. I'd like to remind our guests and panelists that um, the questions can be asked and found in the comments on the Facebook page. Also, if you are actually attending the event via Zoom, you can use the Q&A section to ask your questions. And while um, you can also raise your hand on Zoom and directly ask your question. For those, for those of you who are listening to us in English, in interpretation, English interpretation um, you can choose the interpretation mode in Zoom so as to um, tune in that way. Today we have with us Anastasia um, Shibatryova, who is from the Grassroots um, Initiative, um, feminist, large supporting women and girls um, who suffered because of the war. We also have Maxim Shimakov from the social movement, um, a direct action activist, and also we are supposed to have with us Anastasia Berezina. Um, she is an eco-anarchist and a member of the Grassroots um, Solidarity Collectives and Initiatives, as well as Sergei Mochan, um, a member of the Anti-Authoritarian Volunteer Network, the Collectives of Solidarity. In order to start our discussion, I would like to ask all of our panelists today, first of all, um, I would like to ask you to talk about your activity after the 24th of February this year. So how is your volunteering organized? Um, how do you help people? How do you support them? Um, and then after this short introduction to enable our listeners um, to learn who you are, what kind of work you're doing, the next question. So hello everyone, my name is Anastasia and today I represent this um, grassroots initiative Feminist Lodge. Before the war we were engaged in cultural and educational events and then also we provided psychological support to women and girls and on the 24th February this year changed our direction a lot. Um, after the full scale, scale invasion, some members of our collective um, left the city, Kyiv, and some people um, remained in Kyiv and took, decided to take part in other initiatives. But very soon we learned that um, we joined many volunteering and humanitarian headquarters and initiatives, and we found that the feminist uh, perspective is lacking is our activity we would like to focus more on the support of women and children because we see that those categories are much more vulnerable in terms of social and um, economic crisis like the one we are facing today so we wanted to um, pay special attention to their needs that's why we decided to um, conduct our activities based on our previous network a network of supporters and partners are in ukraine on all the territories, including the occupied territories. So our aim is to help those people who have less chances of receiving humanitarian aid through mainstream um, channels, like, for example, um, people from those regions um, who are left on occupied territories where there are no humanitarian aid, green corridors like Kherson, for example. So volunteering um, would involve going to those territories to help people um, meaning some kind of support, material support, um, some kind of help that is provided thanks to um, money donated by different people. So, for example, we would um, help people in the Hussan region with the help of um, support for uh, women who are mothers um, for children, like, for example, finding food supplies, foodstuffs, for newborns and then 
uh, medicines. That would be also something that we took to those territories. So covering the basic needs, this is what we try to do. That's what we started from, the basic needs of women and girls. Although before that, we basically um, focused on different needs, like cultural and educational needs, but then we understood that um, it does not really make sense to pursue this direction, perhaps on the same scale, so we focused on basic needs. We also helped occupy territories like Zaporizhia, Kramatorsk, uh, where the situation was also very difficult because the uh, city uh, very close to the front line. We tried to use our networking opportunities, all the connections we had um, in the field, so to speak, uh, in those localities, we are working on strengthening this kind of network we have of connections. We're also trying to find sponsors abroad um, who are more or less ready to provide us with this flexible kind of aid via grants or otherwise. And then we have many friends, many acquaintances, many contacts abroad. We are trying to rely on our feminist connections, female connections abroad in order to involve them in supporting Ukraine. So this is how we are working right now um, as this feminist large initiative. Right now, we are all of us back in Kyiv, the members of our group, and we are planning to uh, engage the community. Uh, we'd like to support, to connect with those people who are left in Kyiv. We'd like to reestablish our connections to start organizing um, small scale events in order to build coherence um, in the community, also to involve those people like IDPs who arrived in Kyiv, um, having previously lived in a different place. So we would like to strengthen to build the community. We believe that together uh, we are stronger. Um, our team actually has worked during the um, recent months very often we have people volunteering with us um, but volunteering just based on some individual resources because they've lost their jobs and, and maybe a place to live so we know that partially we can cover for example the expenses um, based on the funds the money we collected um, for us this is very important to support our volunteers to support our team of volunteers in this way thank you Thank you, Nastya Maksim. Would you like to tell us something about your work? Um, thank you, everyone, and I'm very happy to be here today. I represent the NGO Social Movement. My name is Maksim Shimakov. And first of all, I'd like to say that after the start of the full-scale invasion, for us as well as for other grassroots initiatives, the first task was to um, find what's happening and to find a way to act in this situation. A lot of our volunteers found themselves in a more safe and secure locality. Some parts of our organization were people who were um, actually close to the front line. So the first task was to find out where uh, our members are and to help them. And then, of course, a lot of other tasks emerged after the full-scale invasion. We started to work in a new format. Our task was to find what we can do in new conditions to find a new way of um, working in this situation. I think we were successful in this. So generally we have two directions, the external, the internal one, so to speak, internal meaning what's going on in Ukraine, external, our work abroad. After the start of the full-scale invasion, we saw that um, there emerged this huge stream of people going abroad, the refugees, women with small children, to find themselves in a, in a very difficult situation where they could be exploited. Uh, we saw some examples, many actually from Poland, where employers used the extreme conditions for their profit, trying to exploit the people, refugees from Ukraine. So our task was to create this kind of international grassroots communication with um, different anti-authoritarian organizations in order to inform people about their labor rights, about um, different social guarantees to enable them to, um, as refugees, to take part in um, some labor rights organizations and so on. Um, so we cooperated with organizations in Poland, for example, quite successfully in this um, field. And then we realized that after the full-scale invasion, very often established institutions, centralized institutions, 
um, were less successful in performing their tasks because the because the government of Ukraine um, tried to go on working um, as before. We saw this, for example, in the um, um, approach to the question of the external debt, and then there was this neoliberal attack on labor rights and so on. So basically, the burden um, is now shouldered by workers, employees instead of employees in many cases. Um, this labor attack, neoliberalist attack, made, meant that our cooperation on grassroots level as social movements, anti-authoritarian movements became more and more important, and we organized different campaigns to tackle the situation. Um, one of the events, one of the campaigns that we organized was mostly organized by the social movement, but also with the participation from trade unions abroad, um, France, Brazil, Poland, other countries. Uh, we conducted a conference dedicated to different aspects of the war at the start of May, where we um, informed people about our social response to the um, situation of this full-scale war in Ukraine. And then in summer also, based on the invitation of um, social movement, um, the members of parliaments from different European countries, left wing, um, arrived in Ukraine and we talked about the um, shared problems and uh, um, signed this memorandum on our future actions. Because of the full-scale invasion and what it brought to Ukraine, our activities were curtailed because of the limitations imposed on us. Um, one of those would be the impossibility to um, organize our actions, which means that we do not have as many instruments as before in terms of influencing the government uh, speaking up. So we had to reformat our activities. And a successful example of how we did that, I would say, was the campaign of the labor defense, the campaign within which we provide help to people who experience some kind of conflict in terms of labor relations um, at their workplaces. Uh, we have worked with more than 100 cases, um, wages arrears, gender discrimination, and different other problems. So we have some success stories in terms of how we um, manage to support those people and to help them get compensation for the incurred losses or damage. And then we are working in the format of individual uh, strikes at work um, and different flash mobs uh, where we, for example, draw attention to the situation of um, people at the front line um, who unfortunately have some wage arrears. For example, they haven't been paid salaries since April, and we'd like to emphasize the um, situation. So um, people who uh, voluntarily um, came to the front line and uh, are now engaging in combat, they also have some problems um, still in um, what's left of their peaceful existence. Like, for example, they are still employees of some enterprise and they are not being paid. Um, so we are trying to decide the problems we are working with to find decisions, to find solutions based on social sol solidarity and defending the rights of people. Our task is to um, ensure that after the first hot stage of the war, people who lost some kind of social or economic labor rights would be able to return to their previous existence and defend their rights successfully. And we also have Anastasia Berezina with us now. We are inviting her to speak. Um, so Anastasia, we are talking about the initiatives, different initiatives after the 24th of February in Ukraine about how the work was organized. So can you tell us something about how your work went on after the 24th of February? All right. So I'm an activist of the ecological platform. And after the full scale invasion in the first days, we all of us in Lviv, are members of our Lviv group, were able to uh, become members of the territorial defense forces in Lviv. But me and some friends of mine um, encountered the situation where um, self-organized defense forces um, had some channels of communication, but when we tried to 
contact them. Unfortunately, they ignored all requests from women and from girls to join territorial defense forces. Um, so then we looked at how the solidarity voluntary initiatives are developing in Ukraine, and we decided to join this area. It was the only opportunity uh, for us to take part in, in the work being done. Um, so um, the volunteering, the um, grassroots organizations um, we um, wanted to join uh, was the organization represented the same principles that we uphold in our work. Uh, we basically focused on ensuring logistics, organizing a warehouse uh, in Lviv, worked a lot with humanitarian aid arriving in Ukraine uh, for territorial defense forces as well as for volunteers. We needed to pack those goods and then send them to um, people needing them. Uh, what I was inspired by is the solidarity connections imagined between um, ordinary people. Like, for example, you have some social capital in terms of people you know, your neighbors, your relatives, and so on. And basically, um, this small network of connections becomes this um, network that uh, engages in volunteering and sending the necessary aid to the front line, to the hotspots in Ukraine. During the recent months, we have seen many examples that inspire us. Um, this kind of grassroots, for example, um, activity, uh, the activity of grassroots organizations that were maybe less engaged in social activities in Ukraine, but also we saw some examples that disappointed us um, when it comes from ordinary um, citizens organizing themselves. Um, in many cases, they still do not see themselves as a real force. They think that the uh, main activity lies with the gov government of Ukraine, which is not really the case. Um, ordinary citizens are doing most of the work. And um, as for me, um, I would say that our volunteering initiative only started um, existing as a real project um, a few weeks before the full-scale invasion and the project was inseparable from um, the ideas of our um, past work so we organized the meeting where we talked about the principles of our work as anti-fascist and um, anarchists in the case of the full-scale invasion and war of Russia against Ukraine. So we talked about um, people engaging in territorial defense forces or going to the front. And then we said that a part of our members could form this um, grassroots voluntary network supporting people who uh, join the military and remain in the home front. And this is basically what happened. We have this anti-authoritarian unit um, affiliated with the territorial defense forces of Ukraine. And then we have this collective of solidarity volunteers, volunteers network. Since the very start, our basic task was to um, provide for our comrades from this anti-authoritarian unit um, engaging the activities of the territorial defense forces with everything they needed for their fight. Um, and then the number of tasks that we carried out became broader. Uh, more and more um, people with left leanings, anti-authoritarians, started joining territorial defense forces on all of the territory of Ukraine. Their number, the number of such people was growing. And then since we decided to help everyone within this broad anti-authoritarian framework, um, the number of people um, who took part in our volunteering network also grew. Um, the number of people who helped us grow. From the very start, it was important for us to uh, engage in media activities, to organize media campaigns, because all around the world discussions started up um, in particular within the left environment about what's going on in Ukraine, how the events in Ukraine should be considered, whether um, left people globally should, um, left supporters globally should 
um, speak up for Ukraine and provide help to Ukraine. Um, so we saw this as an important mission since the start of the war to um, establish, re-establish connections with left-wing um, supporters globally and to show them that we as Ukrainians um, who are part of the left forces um, are engaged in what's going on in Ukraine. We have our position on that um, and to explain what this position was. So uh, we had two groups, two sections of our um, project working in Kyiv and in Lviv. We managed to establish a successful logistics network. And apart from aid from military servicemen, we started getting other kinds of help, um, help for civilians, like um, medical supplies or uh, food supplies or clothes, for example. Uh, we had a warehouse fully stocked with, with this, and we understood that some of these goods cannot possibly be used for the support for military servicemen. When Russians withdrew from the north of Ukraine, from territories surrounding Kyiv, we started going to the recently deoccupied territories uh, around Kyiv and in the north, and we understood that the situation was really dire, uh, with people catastrophically needed um, needing supplies. So um, we no longer had this question about what to do with the goods stocked in our warehouse, we um, started providing humanitarian aid uh, um, to those territories, to the people needing help. So now we have this military direction in our work supporting all the military servicemen in the anti-authoritarian units. And then we have this humanitarian help uh, direction where we organize humanitarian convoys to um, uh, recently deoccupied, for example, territories, and then there is the media work that we do, and the um, and an import another important part of our work, which I think is very promising, is that we started um, as well as social movement. For example, we started to engage in active work in with Ukrainian trade unions. Um, in many cases, these are also people who joined the fight in Ukraine. Someone was drafted into service. Some people volunteered to become military servicemen. We're basically talking about uh, ordinary Ukrainian workers who are not supported by some funds organizations, uh, which means that um, while our comrades are quite well supported, I would say, and now they are asking us for some technological solutions, advanced needs um, is what they are currently asking us to provide. But in case of, for example, members of trade unions who joined the fight, they have um, very basic needs that need to um, have taken care of. So strategically, one of important directions for us is helping the trade unions of Ukraine. Lastly, um, this is something that uh, we're not focused on, but uh, we are partially engaged in. Uh, we are talking to people on the front line in the military units. Um, they are not just defending Ukraine from the aggression. Um, they are also building up um, the dynamics, uh, the democratization, establishing horizontal principles of communication and cooperation within the army structure. That's what they are working with. And this is a very important uh, line of work. Uh, unfortunately, no one representing this direction was able to join us today, but this is also what um, left wing forces are doing in Ukraine. I do hope we'll get someone from um, those people who are now fighting but I think that uh, it's good that you mentioned them. You mentioned a very important topic. You mentioned um, this um, reconstruction or strengthening of the left movement in Ukraine. So I would like to ask you, first of all, whether the full-scale war gave an opportunity or provided this context for the establishment and um, strengthening of your networks you mentioned for example providing supplies on um, basic needs for people in the occupied territories um, so how was this done did you base your work on pre-existing connections in ukraine and abroad or did you perhaps uh, on the other hand 
um, establish new networks, new connections, which then became the basis for the strengthening of generally the networks in Ukraine. Thank you, Russ, for your question. Actually, it was both things. First of all, we addressed those who we know, those whom we trust, but of course, our network grew a lot. Our advocacy work, our social network had just targeted to audience at some point, those who attend our events, but currently we have more and more people who follow us. These are beneficiaries who might not have been interested in these topics before. That's why we changed our media direction and we're explaining the most basic things at the moment in the social media. Let me tell you about some interesting case. We have been passing some humanitarian assistance to occupied city of Berdansk. We found a local activist who lived in Zaporizhia. So we were able to deliver our assistance to Zaporizhia and she was to deliver it to Berdansk. The driver saw our boxes and he saw our title, Feminist Lodge, and he told an idea that I remembered. I thought that feminists are into some pointless things, but actually they're not. And I liked it because really, if uh, somebody asked me what feminists did before, really I would have no answer. But right now we can position our activities. What we do is feminist humanitarian assistance. We can explain in what way it is different from classic bureaucratic assistance by big funds. That is, it has some vertical alignment. They know, they pretend they know what people need, but quite often doesn't work that way. And the volunteers are searching very different things, like volunteers are searching assistance for the IDPs that don't even have a mattress, while foundations keep on funding some other things, not that necessary. That's why it is very important for us to grow our target audience, for us to build new communications with them, for us to send individual packages for individuals to the country, for example, to those people that were recently deoccupied. And we also add a small leaflet about feminism in Ukraine, about our activities. These are very basic things, but we want people to remember those who helped them during the war, for them to remember that there was some kind of, of a feminist, for them to have positive connotations of the word feminism, positive associations, First, we didn't think a lot about it, and we had some feedback about us being great people and us having a nice initiative campaign, but we are not just nice people. It's important for us to present that our network is being expanding, and it's very important for us to position ourselves for us to have political influence for our activities, to transfer into political activities, because everything what we are doing is just background for the further recovery, for the further development, for us to show that we are doing lots of good things. But you know that, what about people outside our circles? We want people outside our circles to understand this. And this is the thing we, what, that we are working at. That's why, thank you. Who wants to provide another commentary? Let me also remind you that you are supposed to speak not that fast because there is an interpreting. That's why, please slow down a bit for the interpreters to be in line with you. So, Maxim, 
The floor is yours. We have noticed that the, there were some recipes, some reflector recipes before the war, and they changed a lot before February the 24th. We could just come to some workers, to some plants, and uh, we need we had to do some work, but for the moment, all the processes are very prompt or very quick. Right now, you come to any group of people and you hold a meeting, whatever those people are, students, IDPs, the communication is much more easier. So it's important for us to work with these chaotic organizational groups. For example, we are developing the strategy of communication, of cooperation with students. We have this example with students from Kharkiv, like students didn't have enough rooms to hide during the shelling, but the students were able to organize themselves and they started dealing with the issue. However, they lacked necessary coordination, especially with other groups. And this is the issue that we are trying to tackle upon. We are trying to organize or to renew the direct action trade unions in order to make everything more organized. We are trying to provide advice from financial to humanitarian aspect. Also in Lviv, we are trying to continue communication with the IDPs to provide some lectures, not only on informing people, but also in order to get the contacts of people to understand their problems and the way they can deal with their problems. We are trying to understand in what way we can assist them. I can also provide an answer. I would like to do this slowly. The very name of our initiative, Solidarity Collectives, says that we are not just some sustainable community of the same minded people. No, we have very different people of very different groups. That's why I like a lot to see a person from environmental platform. They are are key. Friends in Lviv, or oh, they assist a lot in the collective groups, but these are also some networks outside of Ukraine. I would like to discuss the thing. Nothing would be possible without our activities being supported by people from Poland, Germany, and then a snowball starts, a network of contacts expands more and more. And currently I understand that we have lost a lot prior to the situation, both for Ukrainians and for the left in the world, that this communication did not start earlier. Then we would have far less questions, far less misunderstandings about what's going on in Ukraine at the moment, about the processes, then quite possibly the support would also be far greater, although it is quite nice as of today. Also, I'd like to agree with Anastasia that it is important to communicate with other initiatives because the number is growing, but it's very important for us not to lose our own positioning, our own face. It's very easy to lose everything in this general atmosphere of national unity. Yes, it exists, but nonetheless, we have our own ideas and we need to stick to them. Besides, we need to search for the activists on the local level, local organizers, so to say, who lead some local 
communicates some quite often they know much better what they need than we do and it actually improves our activities our operations and it is also the thing that gives us understanding what to do in future because we'll keep all these contacts on the local level long after our mutual victory when our fight will continue as for the directions that are more relevant to us like social economic rights thank you sir he anastasia would you like anything to add yes i would like to say that i like this consolidation of anarchist and vegan initiatives that started right after the full-scale invasion there were just small groups that were dealing with their own questions they did not communicate between themselves but currently we have communication between various groups for example vegan food was provided to us uh, from abroad and we uh, provided this uh, type of assistance to vegan kitchens to vegan fighters previously we had maybe some bad communication but right now uh, we everything is re-established because we have one enemy and we fight together we have the needs that we are trying to support moreover we have better visibility i like the thing that anastasia told us yes it is gross of reputation of feminists of anarchists of vegan anarchists because we retain our own positioning in the society for example we are part of the solidarity collectives and we are focusing on assisting people victims of the war but still we always remember that we are not supposed to harm animals because uh, yes we underline that uh, all kinds of humanitarian assistance must be vegan and i like that vegan combatants in the armed forces of ukraine are also visible uh, they can be seen in the internal structure of the ukrainian army i just learned that some vegan food is not delivered directly to uh, just some vegan fighters but it should be delivered via the logistics of the armed forces and armed forces can see this and in this way uh, vegans have their visibility and uh, their ideas are being improved yes really so the worst type kind of a transformation okay yes in this way we can see some chaotic cooperation some ongoing cooperation i can also remember some words about maidan of 2013 2014 if you speak about borrowed civil society which is grassroots groups of workers of people of sports clubs that have been mobilized by themselves but not based on the formal existing organizations of civil society they were actually the basis of the revolutionary cause of maidan i think right now you are speaking about something very similar maxim you have spoken about some chaotic cooperation between workers between student collectives yes they can grow into better organized left movement before i open our panel to questions from the audience i would like ask to ask you about the strategy of the left in the further work as a person that researches the right movements at the beginning of 2014 when the war started it was the moment for the right they built the monostructure for their movements and it became key for their mobilization just before the full-scale movement uh, full-scale 
invasion. As for the left movement, I think it was a bit lost. Uh, it didn't come on time, as far as I can see. Such right-wing organizers as Yevhen Karais and everybody else, they're trying to expand their influence through the situation, through growth of their assistance to the military, not just to small scale of right-wing groups, but they're trying to broker the influence in this informal economy of war. I think that Serhi and Anastasia Chibotero has have been speaking about. I think that the left movement has the same perspectives for this growth to in order to expand to new groups, to new social horizons. So my question is, what should be the strategy for your initiatives? And what should be the rhetoric, the message of the left movement, whom it should be directed to? Thank you. I think it's my favorite question because I've been thinking a lot about it. And this moment of conflict, this is all, all the time the growth of the right wing, but it feels like a prophecy which is self made because as a moment we can also have some transformations because women's transformation movement uh, becomes stronger. If you compare it to 2014, the way uh, people understand us, yes, there was huge progress since 2014, but currently I can see lots of challenges because of which the feminist movement uh, finds it harder to accrue some uh, some new influence Be while Ivan Karas has been enjoying new possibilities because he has a reputation he has all the methods and approaches he can but we have our own limits there are events there are meetings with western feminists because there is actually some kind of resistance because there are some circles that sometimes listen to russian propaganda i quite often speak about some expert feminists that are deeply institutionalized yes expertise in feminist movement is quite problematic but it exists and we have lots of problematic questions here the last thing that we are doing it's media project for Nova Vremia media and we I want uh, the major media to speak about for example the Roma feminist activities about the LGBTQ plus activists and so on for us to have visibility for people to see us and in this way we'll get with this political bonuses for us to be ready to political fight but we are having lots of challenges in this we've been cooperating with the international feminist fund who want to check verify our funds for example they have questions to roma activists activity for example she gathered lots of money for the military they have questions about this uh, they believe these are blunt lines when the feminist gathers money for the army, but really, why so? It feels like some people abroad have forgotten the major rule, uh, which is nothing about us without us. Yes, we can see lots of feminist manifests, those who speak about Ukraine without actually involving Ukrainians, without asking Ukrainians. They do not even attempt to hear our own thoughts. Yes, we have some consensus. Yes, right now we can hear lots of voices, but those people did not attempt to do this. It was a challenge for us. They were challenging local Ukrainian activists, and it was a bit harder. Quite often people do not hear us, our voices abroad are muted. 
if if uh, otherwise they actually amplify voices of imperialist feminists from abroad so it's easier for us to promote the actual local feminists that's why we do the best to fight to promote our own ideas because we have the potential necessary and there is a number of journalists that are fluent in this topic that they can influence the national media because our social media accounts of course they do not have the same influence as Hrmatsky, Novaya Vremya, Ukrainska Pravda but when we attempt to work with the major media sometimes yes we have some problems but it's much easier for other people to find consensus and i think it's our internal political situation that is actually uh, uh, preventing us from having more influence it might be used either against us or for us in the time of recovery because ukraine is being prepared for the recovery we have masses of documents and the 24th article of the recovery is about the gender because there was uh, the Lugana conference where Ukrainian government has been searching for the uh, donors for the recovery and there was the gender question included in the discussion yes it was like a very additional question or the major one there was no uh, separate session as of this question i mean that we have some structural changes but i hope that it will be moving in the right direction that will be able to develop the political strategy and we'll see the transformational society after on because reputation is very important as of today uh, people will listen to those people with the authority and it will be the new truth so we need to help people and these people will uh, respect us they will perceive us in a different way that's why it's very important for us to deal with these questions to raise these questions and and this way we'll be making proper political steps we'll be raising the necessary topics for us to widen our political influence then we'll speak about what's possible for us for, uh, for example what about labor rights quite often people do not understand this they don't listen about arguments here that's why the very concept of reputation that's why we need to get political influence not just to repeat the same things from more and more thank you maxim would you like to comment yes so going back to what has been said about the right forces i think that us as leftists leftist organizations uh, we are unable to build one centralized organization that would be able to solve some problems directly and there are many reasons for this this stigmatization of leftist ideas in society some kind of stereotypical vision of the leftist forces and so on so i think that to start with we need to work with different grassroots initiatives small organizations targeting particular specific problems trade unions for example can partially solve the issues with people in the workplace vegan initiatives can popularize the ideas for the protection of animals and us i think we should invest into cooperation with such organizations grassroots small initiatives other organizations which emerge based on the needs of the contemporary movement they can um, later become part of the more global network we all um, defend some common principles like universalism for example and we think that the role of political organization socialist organization which could unite ukrainian leftist forces um, this is something that we see as our task um, in social movement and this is not about creating some kind of inflexible apparatus to guide everyone and govern everyone it's to um the task is to create this sort of network of connections through which we 
would be able to communicate uh, and, um, after all, influence the social and economic policy of the state. Um, and the war influenced the situation with destigmatization of the leftist forces to fold in two ways. On the one hand, we see activists of different organizations like the social movement as well taking part in the uh, combat. And we talk about those things, we make them visible. And then we have queer activists and so on, who also talk about their um, activity within the uh, defense and um, territorial defense forces or military units. Um, they talk about being there, but, but on the other hand, there are there is also a more negative development where we see, for example, the enemy engaging with some leftist ideas um, and Western leftists reacting to that. Um, talk about this new Ukrainian movement that we have here as nationalists, uh, etc. So we need to also cooperate internationally to be visible and work internationally um, to remember that the war after all showed the agency of the leftist forces in ukraine enabled us to cooperate more actively with different partners and organizations abroad and if we continue to develop this cooperation this will help us to strengthen our connections and our position to show our vision of the problem and also within the country to establish the network of connections which would enable us to sooner or later arrive at a political position, political stance that would enable us to um, influence the situation in the country in general. Thank you, Maxim. I would like to remind our listeners that um, you can ask us questions via the chat or raise your hands and then ask your questions personally. So let's start with Anastasia. All right, so I would first of all mention that not all members of the ecological problem uh, platform consider themselves to be members of the leftist movement. We are basically considering ourselves to be eco-anarchists. Uh, we all came from some kind of anarchist background. So we see this parallel between the oppression of nature by humankind of different species um, via husbandry, for example, and other exploitative practices. So for us, the main aim, the main motivation for existence as organization is not influencing some kind of social um, processes uh, in the country. For us, this is all about getting rid of this people-centered, human-centered approach, uh, moving away from this human dominance on Earth. I think the war enabled us to see more clearly and to show more clearly to people what the parallel is. Um, between the oppression, between the cruel attack on civilian population by Russia, when residential buildings are attacked and people are raped and tortured and killed on a mass scale, simply because they live on some kind of territory needed by Putin or someone else and so on. I do understand that this war we have is not unique. We also have similar processes occurring in different parts of the world. So there is a parallel between this and that um, general position that humanity occupies on Earth with us coming to new territories and uh, oppressing and eliminating what's, there, um, what's naturally there. So I think it should uh, enable us to draw some lessons on coexistence on our planet. Us as an organization, I think that the main aim is for us to unite uh, and to cooperate within different kinds of groups to work on the solution to local as well as global problems. Um, it's important for us to cooperate with all the initiatives um, that are close to us ideologically after the war. When we come to Ukraine's recovery after victory, I hope that we will be able to rely on many established connections. We have structures we are working with right now uh, like, for example, the networks of humanitarian aid distribution that we are working with today, and we'll be able to use these connections and these structures for our political purposes. Sergei, the floor is yours. I will probably start by saying 
a few words about how we are working right now tactically and then about the strategic developments. Um, what are the challenges for us for our initiative? Uh, we have never been one structure, united structure. We have different people united by the principle of uh, anti-authoritarianism, but we are all of us very different people with different opinions. So in our publications, in our principles, we never try to impose one kind of uniform political position because we understand that our members have different political backgrounds and opinions. Secondly, our activities are very practical in nature. Very often we don't even have the time to work on some kind of theoretical intellectual product that would explain um, what we're doing and why, what has been done. We are partially doing that, I would say, but that is not the priority for us. We are engaged in practical work, first of all. And the practical work itself uh, also in, involves the problem of communication with the audience. We try to talk as much as possible to Western leftists, to left Western anarchists, telling them about what's happening in Ukraine, talking to us about things which seem obvious to us. But they are self-obvious um, for Ukrainian audience, for Ukrainian public, it's not that important to communicate them to people within Ukraine. The key figures, the target groups we're helping are our comrades, after all, as has been mentioned. So let's say there is uh, someone um, from the right, like uh, the National Trust, who starts helping the wider audience. Uh, in our case, we receive uh, target funds in order to support members of our left-wing movement. And this is what we inform people about. We try to go beyond this structure, but basically we're still working on helping uh, people affiliated with us. And then there is this structural question. There is this quite big interest in Western media to anarchists in Ukraine, to leftists in Ukraine. They are interested in our activities. We can hear a lot about Ukrainian nationalism. Um, in many cases, this is not justified, I would say. Um, in contrast to that, Western audience would like to um, read uh, about Ukrainian leftists and what's happening with them. Um, even mainstream, I would say, Western media are ready to engage with the topic. Uh, we say very often that we are not given the voice, or we are unable to speak, but very often in the West, uh, we are had uh, much better than we are had in Ukraine. The Ukrainian media uh, basically do not work with this topic, do not address us, are not interested in this topic, consider it to be too politicized. So they are afraid of being blamed for, um, for example, repeating the um, words of um, Russian propaganda. Um, Ukrainian right forces have also done a lot in order to equate us with that. So one of the strategic tasks, I think, that we all of us are working on is trying to redefine anti-fascism which has been uh, the term, the concept, uh, which has basically been stolen by Russian propaganda, by Russian forces. Um, we need to prove, and we are working on that, and proving that if you're anti-fascist in Ukraine, you are against fascism, against Putin. And I think this should define, and also what we have been uh, doing previously, in terms of tackling all these questions. This has been um, done quite correctly. Um, the fact that we are focused on practical issues, this is something that we have been doing always, and this is um, an absolutely right direction. But I think that 
we need to also redefine to change something in how we are working. I think we should. And maybe this is um, even being done by some people in Ukraine. Maybe I'm mostly um, based on this in my own experience, but I think we should invest more into establishing connections uh, beyond Ukraine and also beyond leftist groups either Ukraine, in Ukraine or abroad. We need to establish long-term connections with people um, in the fields, in particular localities, grassroots initiatives. We need to, we need to start talking to Ukrainian media more. Uh, we need to start being represented there. I'm happy that for the feminist movement, um, this is something where they have more success than us, perhaps. And we need to begin communicating our principles uh, because continuing to um, tell people that what Russia is doing is imperialism is obvious for us. But we also need to start talking about Ukraine about its recovery and reconstruction, the topics that are very relevant even today. This is what is being discussed by liberals, by the right forces. Um, they are being discussed uh, within different international platforms. So I think it's important that we, within this event organized by the Commons website and channel, it's good that we are talking about this Finally, from the leftist perspective, uh, it's time for us to communicate these messages beyond our circles. So without turning our back on our previous directions of work, it's also time to um, emphasize these positions and to start working in these directions. Um, how we see the society in general, talking about this, not just saying about what we are fighting against, what we don't want to see in Ukrainian society. Uh, Anastasia, would you like to say a few words as well? Yes, I'd like to comment on what Sergei said. I also support the idea of strengthening and expanding our connections internationally for Ukrainian uh, movements. But also I'd like to highlight that based on my experience and I talked quite a lot to people like Maximilian who submitted a question into the chat um, for whom it's difficult to understand our position sort of. So we were really invested into these discussions. We tried to communicate our ideas, but then we understood that even when you're using facts and um, data to prove your opinion, it's very often for people who see stereotypically to perceive you see your position. Um, so maybe we're coming from this position where, if it, where we feel that we are obliged to explain, we, we are trying to justify our actions, but in this way, uh, we're also doing damage to ourselves while trying to um, do everything possible in terms of justifying and explaining we're basically servicing the needs of the international community, but we're not um, helping ourselves. I'd like us to focus perhaps on communicating with those partners abroad who understand our context, like the Kurdish partners, for instance, um, underprivileged groups, um, those who understand that, for example, nonviolent response uh, is not something that you can always rely on. So I would say that instead of trying to communicate bottom up, we should establish connections with groups that are already our um, basically comrades, uh, our fellows in terms of um, being in the same position. And we should communicate that what we're doing in Ukraine is really what's necessary and is really an important part of the efforts um, in Ukraine today. So I'd like, I'd like us to remember that um, while establishing these connections and solidarity, we should focus on groups that are really 
in solidarity with us. Thank you, Anastasia. Um, so we also organized an event of solidarity in with Ukraine in Scotland. Uh, I attended the event during which two speakers who attended the conference of the social movement in Kyiv at the end of summer talked about having to rethink their prejudices um, in terms of humanitarian aid and military aid. Anastasia mentioned this, Sergei mentioned this. Um, there are some things that seem obvious to Ukrainians, uh, leftists or not leftists, but are not obvious for people abroad. Um, I was pleased to see that this movement in Great Britain was able to um, transform this perspective that people in Great Britain were able to see the world and the situation in Ukraine from Ukrainian point of view. And we now have this question about Western political activists in, for example, German socialist movements um, who are demanding that Ukrainian soldiers are fraternized with the Russian soldiers to stand up against the Ukraine bourgeois and the Russian regime. And from this perspective, we can say that we do not like that Ukrainian left does not engage for peace and internationalism between the warring nations. So I would like to respond to that and give our speakers to respond to that. Uh, we should see that not simply as a question from someone who does not agree with us on how to build up the leftist movement. Um, I'd like us to focus also on what the left movement is fighting against in Ukraine, because we've been talking about very practical things so far. We haven't been talking about theoretical questions. For many Western leftists, I think the situation in Ukraine uh, is uh, something that they see from the lens of theory. Um, very often, they talk based on those positions that they occupy about the collective um, peace, um, about the collective left, although um, actually we understand that different groups within it could have different interests and different priorities. Thank you. I, yes, I am very happy always that feminist movements and left movements um, are becoming part of academia, learning the language, mastering the language, uh, and being able to talk to the global north in their language. I'd like to emphasize the very problematic nature of this question. First of all, so we have someone who lives in an uh, imperialist country, the richest European country, and thinks that um, they can demand, um, they can actually demand something from uh, the country which has been colonized and is right now fighting off an imperialist nation in an imperialist war. Um, so is it, is it okay, first of all, to um, approach this situation from such a position? I don't think this is an anarchist position. I don't think this is leftist position, first of all. And then I also want to say that theoretically and practically decolonization of empires is important for us. And we are now fighting against the imperial force um, that is the Russian Federation. Personally, I really strongly support um, everywhere around the world, in all colonized regions, uh, anti-imperialist movements um, that are not strong, unfortunately, very much. The strongest is the one we have in Ukraine, um, the fight on the front, um, which uh, is a high price to pay, but still I believe that decolonization is the future we can fight for together with the colonized nations within the Russian Federation and here in Ukraine as well. Ukraine has been colonized for many centuries and I think this influences the way we position themselves uh, in our relationship to not just um, the Russian Empire but also 
European empire. So thank you, Maximilian, for basically emphasizing what I talked about in my speech. For me, a question illustrates the challenges, the problems we encounter when we try to communicate with people abroad. I think that this kind of approach um, that uh, your question reflects is not leftist, not anarchist, not solidarity based. We try to terrorize on this approach, then we'll see the issue that we are having all the time. If you got it in theory. So, dear Mr. Maximilian, you say that you are from the left wing. I think you are from the Marxist. All of us know that what is uh, the practical issue, but such people usually use deeply theoretical arguments. It's about not seeing half tones. You see, the anarchists have a joke that anything that is not anarchy is fascism. Here we are seeing like the same. We have two bourgeoisie countries, both are led by non-workers, by non-working class. They are having a fight. So why should we get into details? Everything is clear. No, it's not right. There is huge difference between these two countries, between the situations inside of these countries, between the level of democracy in these countries, the level of development of protest forces in these countries, between scales and their vision on the geopolitical area. So, secondly, I would also like to add that there must be practical implementation. Whatever loud your demand is, whenever we may demand it, it won't happen. No, you see, the Russian army, the Russian soldier, they won't just go away. And Ukrainian soldier will not hug a person that came to occupy the territories that is officially committing war crimes, crimes against humanity, it won't happen, whatever and whoever requires or demands this. So I'm sorry, there is some reality and we are the Ukrainian left movement, either anarchist, feminist or ecological, we have a consensus here we take into account the real situation that is ongoing. And I think you are a Marxist, a well-educated one. You are supposed to make a research and then stipulate your demands. Mr. Sier? Yes, I would like to agree with the words of Anastasia and Serhi, and also to add our answer to Maximilian from the practical, practical point of view. You see, the anarchists and participants of all kinds of left movements in Ukraine, as well as all population of Ukraine, they're consolidated in their fight against Russian occupiers due to one reason, our very existence, our existence of movements existence of our movements for vegan emancipation, it's under threat because these movements won't exist under Russian occupation. All our liberties, all our activities that is that are going on in Ukraine, although they meet some counteraction from the government and some state institutions, still 
we have right to exist as a moment and we can promote our vision our ideas in rather free way while in russia we will be put in jails or we would be killed even yes very brief and smart idea maxim yes i agree sir he because really this wording was completely theoretical and from this point of view it may sound right but reality is different before the war before the 24th of february yes we had some solidarity at least with some racial social movements like rsd yes we shared some democratic and socialist views but since the 21st of february we ended our communication because it's an existential question we had nobody to solidarize with in russia after that we may hope that at some point some process in russia will get to some point when they have some anti-war pro-ukrainian socialist movement but we should not underestimate atomization of russian society even after mobilization russians did not start some full-scale actions against mobilization instead the atomization made them leave the country and that is individual action there is no big anti-authoritarian anti-putin political force in russia for us to solidarize with the second danger is that taking into account this perspective that maximilian is proposing then our vision our perspective of ukrainian resistance movement is shifted to something else then we lose our voice we do not speak anymore about what ukrainian people want about our elections but we speak about some general ideas or some general approaches it's a very dangerous approach then we we'll get marginalized in ukraine if russian if some western people say we will not provide you weapons then what's next then we'll have occupation then the map of ukraine will have new areas of influence it's not about social transformations on big scale if you want social transformations we need to support supplies of weapons to ukraine the occupation of occupied territories and uh, support of ukrainian sovereignty subjectivity there is some clarification that social social movement did not break contacts with rsd russian socialist movement actually i would like to make some additions to verse by maxim as you have understood the redistribution of uh, the authority is very important for me and it's very important for us to consider all of this so my stance is that i'm not solid even is in with anti-war feminist movement although sometimes they have the ideas i can share they can say let's listen to ukrainian women but the picture is different you see in the west this movement which is actually marginal in russia and russian activists are extremely marginalized they're about art activism so they're deeply into art some individual projects so they do not influence the situation in ukraine however they were able uh, to attract attention from the west because uh, the west was able to understand them like uh, they're part of the empire and they are against the imperial war so it's uh, a bit hard for the west to understand the resistance of the colonized people against the colonizing power so if i try to 
support the Russian feminist resistance, then I would simply amplify them and my voice would not be heard. It's very important for me uh, to make my own choice. I have no solidarity with them because we should be speaking on the same level. Otherwise, it's not the feminist way. Thank you, Anastasia, for this clarification. There is a huge discussion in our comments about the actual position of the German left as of Ukraine's war. So let me remind you that our discussion is about Ukrainian left, first of all. So a pre last question, please. Please ask your questions. And once again, this discussion is another illustration. And when we speak about the war in Ukraine, about Ukrainian left, Ukrainian anarchists, eco-activists, anarchists, people want to speak about something else. Yes. So I would like to pass floor to Serhi and we have a commentary from Mr. Yurchenko. I think uh, that our Facebook uh, audience cannot uh, see it, so the comment. I would like to see some left movements in European countries, especially in Germany. I would like to see them being active and being focused on fight against their own local oligarchs and providing a good example for Russians, for example. So, Serhi, I would like to say that this discussion is actually taking place, but I don't want uh, this discussion to end. It's very important for us to explain our own vision, but that very left movement in Germany, it's quite various. So we are actually very grateful to a big number of our comrades from Germany who were able to make a huge Evelsin contribution, for example, Anarchist Black Cross from Dresden, this initiative was able to concentrate a big portion of work of our collective. So we cannot understand, underestimate their contribution. Some people do not belong to particular groups, but they bring vehicles to support Ukraine. Like each month, they bring at least one vehicle to support Ukrainian efforts. So my own impression is that, yes, it's great. It's the power of solidarity. That's what it should look like. I can see it, I can feel it. Big number of volunteer initiatives that have appeared in the first days of the war, they cease to exist actually. Some came back to their jobs because they couldn't work, couldn't abstain from work for that long time. Some lost their interest. Some were not able to provide the assistance anymore. Our, assist, our initiative is still working, mostly due to global solidarity, but it's mostly kind of a, a misleading information because it's just a small part, small portion of the international solidarity that could have taken place. So the actual power of international solidarity if it was able to grow, to happen full scale, then it would be extremely big, extremely strong. These networks that are forming, they will be of use in future, not only when we speak about wars, but also in very different cases. That's why it's very important for us to speak, to have discussions, to explain to communicate, 
to find new ties because it amplifies us, it makes us stronger. Thank you, Serhi. We have a comment from Oksana Duchak that cannot speak on herself. So, dear Maximilian, first of all, why do you think you are entitled to demand something from Ukrainian military? Secondly, I have no issues as a cooperation with Russian anti-war movements, but the third thing is that progressive anti-war Russian movement is very weak. It makes no difference, unfortunately. It's not effective. And Ukrainian society cannot just sit and wait until this movement grows and becomes effective and will be able to overthrow Putin. And the fourth stance is that it is an imperialistic war of Russia against Ukraine, which means that we are supposed to end the assault, the attack. So any demands to Ukrainian defenders that are limiting them or that might limit them, they actually support the aggressor. That's why we should be limiting the aggressor. So also there is Katrin Samari, who's telling there is a European network which includes Marxist and non-Marxist people that support Ukrainian resistance other by weapons or in other ways and all kinds of rejection and resistance to war in Russia whatever exists so she is also directing us to the ENSU website. I'd like to comment briefly on the previous question about why a German left forces cannot give us this example of overthrowing the oligarchic regimes they have in their country. I actually thought back in time and thought about the part of the German protest movement I admire and would like us to emulate in Ukraine about the practices of occupying those parks, or forests, or green spaces in city in protest against construction development. I see this as a grassroots example of fighting back against oligarchs, huge corporations of developers and construction corporations. And I think that um, this is something that could be done in Ukraine, in Germany. And I think that Ukrainian movements at the time of the war, the anti-authoritarian volunteer movement, for example, that we have show a great example of solidarity and grassroots help provided to people uh, in particular places. And, and this is the example that European nations could follow um, until they have this moment finally coming that um, all the societies starts up against, in protest against, for example, the war in Ukraine. So I think that uh, we have similar structures in Ukraine and in Europe, but I would like them to grow and I would like them to become more humorous. And I think that the Ukrainian resistance movement gives European countries a great example of how um, activities like that could work. So I think that one of the purposes of this conference for me is sharing the experience of this kind. I th thank you, Anastasia. I think that some segments of leftist movements and parties in Europe still see the war in Ukraine um, as the situation in Iraq, not the situation in Spain, when um, it was necessary to become um, consolidated with the anti-fascist forces. Um, it seems that people forgot about this experience of expressing solidarity with anti-fascist leftist forces. And one comment, we conducted this interview recently 
asking where the question was, uh, do you see yourselves as part of the tradition of the Mahno movement in Ukraine? As far as I remember, the answer was yes, we see ourselves as this historical tradition because as 100 years ago, the anarchists in Ukraine are fighting, are resisting against um, Russian occupiers, aggressors, but also we see some modern challenges and um, we see the Western imperialism more transparently than before. And within this round table, actually, we saw some examples um, that illustrates that. And also the modern context involves the uh, aspect of the oppression and the destruction of nature. This is the moment which is important for me, so I'm always trying to go back to this. I think it's important not to lose that part of our agenda, um, not to forget about it in the current war context. We also have this question from Facebook from Alena Lyasheva saying, um, so right now we are all for demanding weapons, but what do we do after the war? Do we demand that the um, defense industry, nuclear weapons, for example, such aspects should be or shouldn't be developed uh, in recovery? And then what do we do about places like uh, Georgia with the occupied territories there? Do we express solidarity and with whom? I think it's a good question. Alona, thank you. It's a difficult question to answer, I guess, because we don't know what kind of conditions we will have, um, what kind of victory we will have. I think that the answer to your question about weapons and the development of the uh, industrial complex depends on what we arrive at. So let's think back to each carrier wars, for example. Um, the first one of those just gave Russia the time to draw lessons from uh, their defeat and then to prepare for the second war properly. And then the second war in Ichkaria unfortunately ended badly for the people of Ichkaria. Ideally, I would say we shouldn't develop the weapons, the arms complex, but um, it's not an ideal world. I am in Ukraine, I am in Kyiv, I understand what kind of danger we're facing. I know what's going on in the occupied territories. So for me, this question is a very practice-based one and a very painful one. Of course, I would be happy to say yes after the war. We'll say make love, not war, and stop developing um, these directions. But it all depends on whether we are likely to face conditions where the repetition of this, um, um, the um, you imagine so this situation will be likely, but perhaps the collapse of the regime in Russia will happen or the regime will, would become a democratic. So if we see that there is no threat for Ukrainian society, no threat of this situation being repeated, then um, the answer to the question would be we stop developing the weapons, complex, etc. And the second part of your question, yes, of course, we, we, we have to express solidarity with other oppressed peoples. The first people to contact me after the full-scale invasion were activists from Bosnia and Herzegovina uh, and other places uh, like Georgia, because they knew based on their experience what we are undergoing. So for them, it was much easier to understand our experience. People, activists from Georgia, um, especially. Um, those peoples that are colonized in the framework of the Russian Federation are also our allies, although unfortunately right now they do not have enough political influence in Russia, for example, the consciousness, even the desire perhaps to achieve the autonomy which they had before the uh, Putin regime came to power. So we are running out of time slowly, so very brief responses. Please. And I have another question. I'd like to comment um, on the previous question as well, although it's difficult to do that briefly, in fact. But still, um, a lot will depend on what the war will bring us. The conclusion of the war will bring us personally. I think that the world needs a new global movement against nuclear weapons and in favor of dearmament. But unfortunately, um, there are problems that are always repeated time after time. You have 
a couple of imperialists who never take part in this movement. So part of the world uh, is BND, and the part of the world is, on the other hand, accumulating weapons. And this creates challenges and risks. Um, personally, I would like to see this movement emerging at some point again. But this is definitely this is definitely something that the world needs, because we see right now how one country can manipulate others, can blackmail other countries um, with nuclear weapons and try to impose their will upon all the peoples of the world um, via such means. Anyone could do that, any other country. It's not just about Russia being the bad country, the bad sheep. Generally, that's the problem with having the weapons of mass, mass destruction in the world uh, and the possibility of controlling those countries, big countries with global ambitions who have nuclear weapons, weapons of mass destruction. As to the movement we should support, maybe shouldn't support, um, I always was in favor of supporting progressive anti-colonial movements, but we always have to make sure we don't make the mistake made by our Western colleagues very often when we, we, we need to listen to people in particular countries, particular regions when deciding uh, which movements to support and how to support them. We have no right to impose our vision uh, which is uh, informed by theory purely, our vision concerning who has the right to become deoccupied, decolonized, etc. We need to hear the voices of those people who are directly concerned with this. We need to get their grassroots vision. Personally, I am always in support of all the progressive uh, liberating movements. Uh, Anastasia, there is a comment from you. I'd like to briefly respond to this. For me, uh, it doesn't matter what kind of um, progressiveness or democratic nature, the future potential Russian regime is characterized by. For me, it's still the regime that has many occupied territories, uh, occupied, colonized Parts. And for me, this war which we have is anti-colonial, anti-imperialist war. Um, until the last dictator dies, and there should be no rest. This is the slogan I had today, and I totally agree with this. If some anti-colonialist movements emerge in some places, me personally as an anti-imperialist will support um, th those movements in any way possible, um, informationally, materially, and so on. But if such movements do not emerge in particular places, of course, we cannot simply come to those places and dictate our will, impose our vision of liberation on people in a particular region. I think it's too early to say what kind of conclusion we will have to the war, whether the military industrial complex will develop or not. But anyway, we should support the democratization of our society. We should ensure that um, the making of political decisions becomes more transparent uh, in order to make sure that some political forces in Ukraine um, do not um, um, push the society in the direction of those values that are hostile to us. So we should ensure that there is more control, more monitoring and more transparency in political, economic, etc. decisions in Ukraine. And we have a question from one of our listeners based on the previous question do you see any potential of cooperating with leftists in moldova and georgia you probably do not see any possibility of cooperation since you are silent uh, we do have some connections with a part of leftists in moldova A small delegation arrived at the start of 2022, before the start of the full-scale war. But these connections are quite weak. 
plus and I see this as a problem because when we communicate, we see clearly that the processes, processes now countries are very much like. Uh, there is no interest, I would say, to Moldova in Ukraine. It's like um, France, for example, um, that is absolutely not interested in Ukraine. For some reason, in Ukrainian society, uh, we do not really care about what's going on in a neighboring country in Moldova, despite the similarities that Moldova and Ukraine have. I think this is something that we need to overcome. We need to establish these connections and to communicate and cooperate with Moldova comrades more closely. Same goes for Georgia. We do have some connections with them, but they are not structured, they're not comprehensive for now but um this is also that we see as a priority to develop them uh, maxim a comment from you not sure about moldova but in georgia we do have some contacts with the activists there and recently even um one of our activists member of the board of the organization visited georgia um, and uh, communicated with the activists there I think it's very important to exchange experience because the context of our country is very similar and we can exchange experience to create other new mechanisms of fighting against imperialism. So we continue our cooperation with them and we're trying to organize shared joint campaigns. I also think that although we all understand that this is necessary, um, the connections are not that weak, and we also um, see this. I think it's a question of resources and political will. So when we talk about Georgia, Moldova, about us, about the movements that are partially marginalized in a situation where you have limited resources, we understand in Internal struggles within Germany better than in Moldova, simply because the German movement has more resources and is building connections in a better way. So it's about practical challenges, I would say, behind this situation. It's not just that we don't care what's going on in the neighboring country, it's rather um, the question of us having a lot of problems and a lot of struggles and this creating a barrier in our communication and uh, this region becoming more atomized as a result. We also have a comment from uh, the Czech Republic, um, from our listener who says that um, he is a member of the local initiative who, together with the Raza movement in Poland signed um, many petitions and declarations in support of uh, leftists in Ukraine, but unfortunately in the Czech Republic, there are tendencies within the left to towards um, demanding cooperation and peace negotiations between the US and the Russian Federation, because they think that we have a proxy war in Ukraine. And this is also increased by the general um, atmosphere of fear. So very often in the Czech Republic, they talk about not supplying any of the parties of the war with weapons, but still the majority of his com comrades are in solidarity with Ukraine and support Ukraine. So he would like to express solidarity with us. And we have a comment from Yulia Yurchenko. Um, a response to the previous discussion about the German left and the comment is about the inability of the left forces in Germany to stand up to um, the ruling class in Germany. So Julius saying, I know that the left in you is working against their own oligarchy unsuccessfully for years. So my comment is it's callous to demand from a country at war with limited economic sovereignty to achieve what one failed themselves in much more favorable conditions. Uh, this is heartless 
is especially coming from Germany, who had plans to turn Ukraine into a farm not so long ago, and sensitivity of the situation must be understood. Безсердечно для коментаторів з Німеччини, де тобто країна, яка донедавна намагалася перетворити Україну в такий імперіалістичний ресурсний придаток. Я тут трошки не точно перекладаю для слухачів, які не бачать чату. Я заїкаюсь, тому що намагаюся. So I'm sorry, my translation is not quite adequate. Perhaps I'm trying to read this from the chat and translate it on the go. For our Ukrainian listeners, I would say that we have touched upon quite a wide uh, set of issues. If our panelists have something they would like to add, or maybe some comments on what was previously said, then perhaps this would be a great way to um, summarize our discussion. We still have a couple of minutes. If I may, very briefly, I would like to express my gratitude to people commenting, asking questions, writing about the solidarity uh, with Ukraine. We feel the solidarity. Um, this is very important for us. And I hope that um, this expression of solidarity will grow into something into the, in the future. And I would like to express gratitude to the Commons Journal, who, the organizer of the event, Um, I really think that finally someone um, organized something that has um, that had to be organized for a long time. Finally, someone started talking about the left um, having to formulate their political vision, their political position in a new way. The vision of the post-war Ukraine, although we're still at war, um, the vision of changes we would like to see in the society. Um, this is this is a challenge for all of us, but also an inspiration to all of us, all of us who continue working within the framework of their project, their organization in Ukraine, doing what we are doing. I would like uh, to join these wishes and I'm very grateful to the organizers for this platform. We were able to speak about our activities. It was great for discussion. The platform for the development of strategic aims. It's just the very first thing that I thought about because we are dealing with practical things all the time. So it's great for us to have this space where we can find uh, points of cooperation. It's very great. It's great. I appreciate it a lot. I'm very grateful to you, to us for moderation. I'm grateful to all the viewers and commentators. It was a great experience for me, although I was quite critical today. I had some bad experience that I have spoken about, but still I had very nice experience as well. So I'm very grateful for those who supported us from abroad, for those who believe in our ideas that we are promoting. So I feel all the solidarity and attention that my movement didn't have before. So I'm very grateful to all of you for these few hours. I join. Enjoying these words of gratitude, and let me underline that all these comments that supported us are very inspiring. And we also had some criticism, and it was great for the dialogue. We were able to speak out our position, and we attempted to persuade people that did not agree with us. So it was very productive for us not only to speak with the audience, but to have discussion between ourselves, to have some contact between our organizations. So I'm very grateful for, to organizers for this event. I would like to join to all these words of gratitude and to the Commons Journal and to everybody 
that was asking questions and posting comments. It was very important for all of us to speak out our stance as for the war in Ukraine, and we were able to deal with the most urgent, most pressing issues. I think that after this event, I would like to have another event like this because I have lots of to speak about. Lots of information was gathered during the last months of this full scale invasion. And I appreciate this dialogue between the Western left and the Ukrainian resistance movement. So, once again, thank you, organizers. I would like to see more events like this. This event will also take place like in an hour, uh, quite similar event. Uh, so I would like to say I'm grateful to all the participants and I'm grateful to everybody who have been listening or watching us from abroad. Your support is very important. If you do not follow the common journal, if you do not support it via Patreon, please support us, please follow us. Also join the platforms that you have been hearing about today. And I'm very grateful to Alessia Komishnikova and Ivan Deneka for their interpreting, for their very nice conference interpreting that made this discussion possible and that expanded the number of participants to those from abroad. So once again, I'm grateful to Alessia and Ivan. I hope we'll meet again. So have a nice day.